Black people can no longer talk about I. See, that whole individual thing has to be thrown out. This is, you know, what one thing that college students have to understand because most of the cats who come down and talk about I got my stuff together is cats who are coming out of college. You have to understand that, you know, you, if you're speaking, you have to be speaking for the struggle. You cannot be talking for yourself because I know what's going to happen if you get caught out there by yourself. <laughs> You're going to be looking for everybody else at that point. <laughs> the whole thing of, you know, like collectivism, the whole thing that's not pushed in this country, if you understand again the politics of the country, then you understand why it is not pushed. You understand why America finds it profitable, in her sense, to push the whole thing of individualism. It's the whole rule of divide and conquer, when as America, the patriots America, of America do not exist as individuals. In reality, white people in this country do not exist as individuals. See, the police have a line talking about, well, we are a minority too. But that's not true, because they reflect the attitude of the majority of the people in this country. And white people, the white people who are racist, the white people, you know, who are capitalists and who oppress people, they reflect the attitude of the majority in this country. So they do not exist as individuals. So black people have to understand that whole thing of individualism is a luxury that we can ill afford. We cannot afford to be individuals in this country. We do not exist as individuals in this country. We must begin to hammer out an ideology of revolutionary nationalism that says that every group Black people should be nationalists. Puerto Ricans should be nationalists. You know, like, white people should be humane, nothing else. <laughs> because we cannot talk about white nationalism in this country at this point because of the way it's defined and what it means. We have to talk about white people being humane, nothing else. The American Indian can talk about nationalism. And when all of these groups, when these groups, you know, began to launch the type of revolutionary nationalism in their country, in their communities, when they become nationalists, then we can talk about waging a people's struggle. We cannot talk about waging a people's struggle in this country before then, before each individual group becomes nationalistic in the sense that they are organized and that they are get together for their own purpose. And that purpose, you know, in the end result will be ending re of repression and oppression of the masses of people. Then and only then you can, can you talk about grouping and launching a people's struggle in this country. The whole thing of politics in this country is that the politics plays upon the individual. And the, one of the mistakes of the movement has been that we have been a victim of that whole thing of the individual. See, the man always points out an individual and he tells you that's your leader. He says that's your leader. Well, you have to examine what he's doing. When he pushes a guy out there and says that that's your leader, he also understands that he can pull that cat in. He can destroy that cat when he gets ready. See, we must begin to relate to concepts, not individuals. See, don't ask me, you know, like, what's wrong with Carmichael and the Panthers? Understand what they both are saying. If you understand the ideology that they're pushing, that's sufficient. Then you take a side on that ideology. Don't take a side on the personalities. So you've got to understand the difference. You have to understand the difference between concepts and personalities. See, the man, he found out it, it's very easy to destroy an individual or to discredit an individual, but it's much more difficult to discredit a concept or an idea. So what he does is that he pushes individuals out. He tells you this is your leader. Black people will decide when they need leaders and they will decide who their leaders are. At this point, our job becomes, those people who understand the nature of the struggle, our job becomes to organize black people, to organize for revolutionary struggle, not to be projected as leaders. And at this point, the only force in the black community that will be able to wield a revolutionary ideology will be a political party, a party that pushes that ideology, some type of apparatus that speaks to black people, because if you don't have an apparatus, if you don't develop alternatives for people, then the people are shuttled right back into the system. And you say, well, you know, we ain't making no progress. See, the role of the vanguard in any revolutionary struggle is to lead. When it ceases to lead, it ceases to be the vanguard. The vanguard is no more than the guardians of the struggle. 
And people have to understand, people with certain skills, that's your role, students, that's your role. You have to occupy the vanguard position in the struggle because you have certain skills, because you can do certain things. You cannot divorce yourself from that community. You cannot sit your college apart from the community that you came from. See, down south, what happens down south in black universities is that when they build a black university, there's usually a physical boundary. It's a railroad track or a lake or something that separates that black university from black community. And so what happens is automatically black students begin to assume that they're different from the people on the other side of the tracks. So all of a sudden they get scared to go out there to where they got to buy their wine, because that's all they're going across for. They get scared to go out there because they think it's an entirely different person on the other side of the track. Again, the man has divided. He's made black people think that they're different. That's again, again, that's a luxury we can't afford. You have to understand in terms of how the man moves, how oppression comes down. He stratifies the community. If you examine what happened in terms of the Jews in Germany, he didn't just vamp on the Jews. He got them segment by segment, in other words. The rich Jews say, well, he ain't gonna mess with us. He's just getting them poor Jews, them troublemakers. <laughs> the same thing happens here in the black community. During the rebellion, black people who were doctors and who were professionals said, well, they ain't gonna mess with us. They just getting the lawbreakers. But what really happened was that one of them doctors got caught out there in Newark and the cop whooped his head till it broke like okra. <laughs> then he started talking about we and us. <laughs> See, but that's the whole, that's the nature of repression. Repression tends to force people together. And it becomes a question as to whether the vanguard can afford to wait till repression forces them together. Given that, you know, a lot of people, the masses of people even say, will be forced together as a result of repression. The question then becomes, can the vanguard afford to wait until repression forces them together? See, if we are correct in our assumption that the man is coming down every day against black people, then where does that leave, leave us? If he has a timetable, if he operates off that timetable, is it the role of the vanguard to sit back and let that timetable expire, or is it the role of the vanguard to offset the timetable? This is a question that students, again, people who should be occupying vanguard roles in the struggle because of the skills that they have, nothing else. Because of the skills. You have certain skills that can be utilized. Students should be organizing welfare mothers. Students should be organizing young schools. You should be educating kids who are being trained every day. You should be educating. So you have to see your role because you have certain skills. You see, a revolutionary is not only a person who shoots a gun. See, I think a lot of times we've overemphasized the role of the gun in revolutionary struggle. A revolutionary is not only the person who shoots a gun. A revolutionary functions in the struggle on whatever level he happens to be. See, there's something that's going on out at uh, the IBM plant. Somebody's out there sabotaging the machines. They don't know who it is. Could be Leroy Double O Soul Buckwheat Johnson, Jr. <laughs> they don't know what's going on, but they know that their machines are breaking down. He's committing a revolutionary act against that, against that company. So wherever you exist, you can exist in a revolutionary fashion if you are committed to revolutionary struggle. See, it's no longer adequate for us to say that we're going to have revolution by any means necessary. You have to begin to define the means that are necessary. You can't say struggle by any means necessary because, again, you're allowing cats to do their own thing. You allow a cat to say, well, you know, I'm fighting a revolution in this way, Jack. I'm going to get some of the mad money. And that's how I'm fighting a revolution. You must lay down guidelines for revolutionary struggle. And to do that, you must have a revolutionary ideology. People have to understand that in terms of ideology, ideology is shaped as a result of struggle. You don't just sit up one night and come up with the correct ideology. That ideology happens as a result of struggle, of being out there working with people. See, the mistakes that a lot of black people make in terms of going to the black community is that you go in there with a program. Go in with an ideology and work around the programs that exist. Don't go in there with a program. People got a program. They got to have a program to live every day down there. 
but go in there with an ideology that can tell that cat, I can make, you know, this a little easier on you. We have a revolutionary ideology that tells, you know, in terms of the cat who hustles, that, you know, if you do such and such a thing, you can, you know, in terms of alleviating the pressure and the oppression on other brothers, this can be done. Don't go in there and tell the brother, look here, man, put down your hustling, you know, give up your numbers. What do you have to offer him? Infuse in his mind how can he use the money that he gets. You know, we need a cut of the money from the numbers to run a revolutionary uh, uh, organization. Then look at here, brother, this is what I want to talk to you about. See, I want to talk to you about, you know, giving me a cut of the money that you're getting from the numbers. That's your revolutionary duty. That's your revolutionary obligation and your revolutionary duty. Don't go there and tell the cat, look at here, man, you got to give up that stuff. Because I got something better. It might be better. It might, but you're telling that cat to give up something that, you know, the way he, he knows how to live. That's his skill for a program that he has never tried, for a program that you don't know if it's going to work. See, because most of our programs is theory at this point. The application of theory is the proof of theory. When we begin to apply that theory, when we can tell a cat that we got something that'll work, that's when, you know, cats will begin to come on. Until then, we have to use people on a level where they exist. We can't tell a cat, look at here, man. I mean, I don't, you know, don't go to the wall unless we got an alternative for it. What alternative do you have for a cat who you don't let go to the wall? You either make him aware that he's going to spend some time in jail and you prepare him for that. But to tell him, you know, just, hey, man, don't go to the wall. The cat's going to look at you and say, well, what you got better? What, you know, what you got to offer me, man? I might be able to go to the wall and become a typist. What do you have better to offer me? See, programs exist in the black community. What we have to do is to forge a revolutionary ideology that makes those pro programs work for the struggle, make the programs work for the struggle. Now, in terms of the whole role of college students at this point, black college students in particular, you have, you know, a vast, you know, there's a colony in Bedford-Stuyvesant, there's a colony in Harlem, you're surrounded by them. We need people, you know, to do work, to organize black people. We need people to go in and to work with black people, to infuse black people with that type of revolutionary ideology. Because if they don't have it, then every time Nixon comes up and screams that he got a new program, black capitalism, uh, which is, you know, a myth, then they're going to try it out. They're going to go for the ghosts. <laughs> You go for the ghost, you, you know, you laugh, but you go for the ghost. See, the whole thing, you know, like in terms of where we are at now, where a lot of us are at now, is that we have infused as an ideology, or for an ideology, the whole concept of militant blackism. In other words, it has become sufficient for a lot of us to be black, to be black and proud. But understand that there is no contradiction between singing America is my home and saying that I'm black and I'm proud. There is no contradiction. So a lot of us are just at the point where we are black and proud. That's not sufficient. We must go beyond our dashikis, our beards, and our beads. You have to go beyond that. See, because we have to under... You have to understand that what happens in terms of a country of this nature is that you cannot talk about creating something until this thing has been destroyed. An old principle, the first principle of physical science says that two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. So you cannot build where something exists. You cannot talk about building where something exists. And a lot of us are just at the point where, you know, like, we in our dashiki bags. But understand, you have to go beyond that. What you gonna do if the man come to your house and you ain't got nothing but a dashiki? You gonna beat him off with a dashiki? <laughs> Are you gonna butt him with your natural? <laughs> so that says to be black does not, not ensure survival. Just because I'm black does not mean that I will survive what this man has to put down. So we have to be you know, aware of that whole thing, that blackism is not an ideology. And people can be black and be individuals. A whole lot of dudes who were screaming that they were Negroes are now black and still doing the same thing. <laughs> so we have to go beyond that whole concept of just, you know, the natural and the dashiki. Because, you know, if you look at in terms of, you can really gauge the, the tenor of the country 
by the way they program you over the, the idiot box in terms of the TV thing. Okay, you used to have I Spy, which was an extension of the Long Ranger. <laughs> it was a logical extension for the Long Ranger. I mean, my man was Tonto, nothing else. <laughs> Tonto. But then you look today, what you have on TV today, and on the radio, you got the dude in the blue dashiki, the Newport dude in the blue dashiki, on the radio, commercials. I mean, this reflects the air of militancy. This is a whole new thing. White folks will co-op dog shit, man, if it's to their advantage. <laughs> if that's to their advantage, they will co-opt it. The militant black, they found it necessary to co-opt that to make it harmless. So they will show you the militant black. They show you a dude on, on TV. This dude, look here, he can't do wrong right. This cat can't do wrong right. <laughs> but he's a militant. He a militant. He's standing there. He got on all his, all his uniform. He got on his uniform and everything. He's talking bad. He woofing. But in the end, whose side does he come over to? He said, well, yeah, this, said, well, yeah, this is my country, baby. And uh, yeah, you know, and I, and I was going the wrong direction. I mean, the man programs. He programs. He's always wheeling and dealing, man. And you have to understand that the way he trains people. See, he trains people. He trains you to act a certain way. He will train you to be good black figures because he has conceded blackness. The first political victory that black people won in this country was the fact that they said that we are black. They established the fact that, you know, we will not be recognized as Negroes, we are black. The man said, wow, Jim, you know, okay. He said, you know, we'll concede that. We concede blackness to you, but we will not concede revolutionary struggle. We will not concede revolutionary nationalism. We'll concede black because then he still can sell that program about, you know, like the whole thing of integrating, the whole thing of blacks integrating with whites. He just changed the word. He quit saying Negroes integrate with whites. Now he says blacks integrate with whites. So you have to understand that he's still, he's just using black people. He's not using black people to speak the language of black people. He's just putting people in to mimic his language. Just new faces. It's the same old game. Just new faces, that's all a new color. You have to understand that the whole thing of incorporating and developing and forging an ideology is very important when you begin to deal with the masses of people, especially the vanguard, people who are the vanguard, people who will begin to articulate and people who will begin to supposedly educate the masses of people. You have to understand that what's necessary is an ideology that go goes beyond that whole thing of, you know, like just physical state of blackness. Because what we are talking about is surviving in this country. That's the whole thing. We have to survive in this country. See, this country oppresses people around the world. It's not just here. It's not just in Vietnam. It's just in Latin America. It's in Africa. It's all around the world. So if people became, but we, you know, we as individuals, we as black people hold the key to liberation for people around the world. See, if people in Vietnam were to become free tomorrow, that would not affect the freedom of people in North Korea. That would not affect the, pe the freedom of people in Puerto Rico. See, it's just like an octopus, you cut off his tentacle. He still got tentacles in other places. But if black people see themselves as being a colony in the eye of the monster, we got his brain. You destroy his brain and you, you freed Vietnam, you freed you know, Africa, you freed Rhodesia, you freed Latin America. Because this man is the chief oppressor of mankind. You have to understand that in terms of his wealth, his wealth is made through the oppression of people around the world. So when we talk about, you know, like replacing the man, when we talk about an ideology that's limited in scope, that does not talk about destroying the system, a system that demands exploitation, then we are talking about replacing the man. Whenever we talk about, you know, like, well, I don't want to destroy, you know, like this country then you're talking about replacing them. See, I'm as much against a black cat oppressing people around the world as I am a white cat oppressing people around the world. Wouldn't make me any difference. I would struggle just as hard against a black cat who oppressed black people because it would be necessary to oppress some people in this country if you took the seats. If all the white folks in the world were to die and black folks moved in on those in the seats and assumed those positions and business went on as usual, then Vietnam would continue. Rhodesia would still be imprisoned and oppressed. 
and it would be because of the, you know, the economic pursuits of this country. The only way that this country can stay wealthy is that it oppresses people. Capitalism demands exploitation in some form of other people. So when we're talking about creating an ideology, we have to talk about ideology that's free from that type of economic oppression and physical oppression, because the physical oppression comes as a result of that economic pursuit. So we have to talk about, we have to begin to examine, we can't be immune, we have to examine all ideologies. We just can't be immune because the man says, well, you, you know, that's communism, or that's socialism, you shouldn't talk about that. See, I mean, this is the role of the student. You have to begin to articulate that. And I'm not saying that, you know, you take a struggle and bring it over here intact. I'm not saying that. Because you cannot import and export revolution. What I'm saying is begin to examine the concepts of socialism. Understand what the man means when he says that the entire wealth of the world belongs to all people. Which again goes back to what American politics is not based upon. Because American politics is based upon property and land. And a question that has to be raised at this point is how can you own land? See, if white folks could figure out how to bottle air, they'll do it <coughs> to make profit off of it. If they could figure out how to bottle air, they would bottle air. They could figure out how, you know, to measure water in cubics and issue out water every day, they would do that because they could make profit off of that. So you have to understand that how in the world can people, you know, talk about owning land, water, and air, because land is just like water and air in that sense. We have to be talk about using the modes of production, the technology. We're not talking about destroying the technology because technology is not an evil in itself. It's how that technology is employed, how that technology is used. We're talking about sieging that technology and using it to benefit mankind, not to oppress mankind. You realize that this country is technically capable of feeding people around the world. But they don't even feed black people in the country. Over 500 black kids die each year alone in Alabama for lack of proper food and nourishment. Which again goes back to the politics of this country. And where black people are concerned on that level, that's the politics of genocide. He's exterminating black people actively. He's starving black people to get to death. So we're talking about seizing control of the technology and using it so it benefits mankind, so it benefits all black people, all oppressed people, people around the world. And this is what we have to be concerned about. I'm going to end because I um, understand that there's some questions, I mean, that people would like to raise. But in ending, I want to say that we have to consider ourselves as the authors of new justice. We have to see ourselves as the authors of a new justice. And wherever we find injustice and tyranny, we must stamp it. We must kill it. Frederick Douglass said the world belongs to the youth. Our job is to seize that and to make the world more humane. That has to be the role of any revolutionary or any person who considers himself revolutionary. Do you feel that black people will ever have a strong political voice in this country in the formal sense as we understand it? You mentioned that you don't think that this could ever come about. Uh, is there any chance that it might? No, I, see, I think that's a reformist, you know, like, position to assume for me to say that people, black people, will one day occupy in this system political offices of importance. Now, you know, this brings on a whole discussion of control, you see, and how you control. Because anything that you don't control is used as a weapon against you. Now, in terms of Black people occupying positions. America has created in Cleveland, Washington, D.C., and Gary, Indiana, a type of neo-colonialism. In other words, the man has set up a puppet regime. These black people they are responsive to the needs and the realms of the Democratic Party and not of the masses of black people. If who's ever, I'm sorry, if Johnson is president or whoever is president were to tell Stokes or Hatcher or Walter Washington to send black people to concentration camps, then there would be no discussion because they would see it as their job because they hold a position that's, you know, responsive or that's sensitive to the Democratic Party. Do you view those that are in prominent positions that are black uh, sort of a token uh, gesture on the part of the establishment, like a member of the Supreme Court bench that was a black member of the cabinet and so forth? 
I think that has to be examined in the sense of progress and as to whether black people have made progress in this country. My contention is that black people have not made progress in this country. America has given blacks um, some concessions out of political necessity, their political necessity. They gave Thurgood Marshall a position on the Supreme Court to appease black people. In other words, we didn't put Thurgood Marshall there. They can take Thurgood Marshall whenever they get ready. We put Adam in office. They took Adam out. They gave black people an astronaut, and they killed him. So what happens is that that has to be viewed in the light of concessions. The very fact that the man can concede a position to you tells you that you do not have a position of power where you can demand or that you can mandate something. How do you think that the press has affected uh, the black situation in this country? I think news media and media in general uh, are, are very negative in terms of any revolutionary movement or any movement that, you know, forces the change of the status quo. Now, media has always been an enemy of black people because what media has done is media has always singled out people who had vanguard positions or vanguard attitudes and tried to make these people an enemy of the masses of people. In our case, you know, like, make, make individuals enemies of black people. Malcolm X would be a good example. More Negroes feared Malcolm, Malcolm X than white people because news media told black people that Malcolm was bad. Muhammad Ali, the reason that Muhammad Ali could be given the maximum sentence and the maximum fine and the black community did not revolt was because Muhammad Ali had been made an enemy of black people. Adam Clayton Powell could be legally lynched, politically lynched, and black people did not revolt was because the man had told black people that Adam Clayton Powell was an uppity nigger. He had legitimatized his own action through news media. So the news media is a tool of oppression. What about your personal experience with the press? Do you feel that the press has given you a fair shake? You see, uh, in terms of myself as an individual, you know, whether I get coverage or not, doesn't make any difference. But in terms of ideas, in terms of the flux of ideas, or the flow of ideas, right, your I, see that, yeah. Yeah, I, see, I see that the press has deliberately created a vacuum in terms of deliverance of attitudes or positions to the black community, which is to be expected. We cannot rely upon white news media to convey black revolutionary messages. So, you know, like the press is doing their job. And as to me, you know, like what happened to me last year with the press was that that was a boycott against me. ABC, NBC, and CBS. You know, anything that Rap Brown did, you know, like you blacked out. Because, you know, just like that, no question about it. And this was the whole attitude that, had been, that has been assumed by news media. And black people do not control news media, so they cannot expect to turn on TV and find out what's going on in the black community. Just like, you know, for example, in New York Times, one of the biggest pieces of white nationalism that exists in the country. 